like you, you know, give you a little synopsis of it, um, and maybe do a little bit of a, a, a Fenwick-esque kind of thing at the end and throw out some, uh, my attempt at being a little bit provocative with some ideas about um, what we should all be thinking about and, and the way forward um, in what I have been referring to and I wrote about in my book as, as the, the third uh, renaissance of bird conservation in this country that we're sort of waiting to, to crush the wave and maybe uh, maybe we're, we're there with some of the changes that are happening now. I don't have to remind any of you about the amazing um, increase in the pursuit of bird watching and, and other outdoor ho hobbies. Um, you know, we know about the number of bird festivals and the amount of you know, new bird books and, and, and optical equipment that comes out every year. And we have seen the statistics, you know, birding and wildlife watching the fastest growing outdoor pursuit that there is in the country, you know, estimates 40 to 80 million people. I think it was, I heard George had, had the, uh, said in a, some kind of a media thing that there's, there's more um, birders than there are conservative uh, Christians or something like that. Is that the right? I thought that was a, a neat uh, way, a neat framing idea there. Um, and so we have this, this phenomenal rise, and yet at the same time we keep seeing the kinds of information that Lynn told us about. Um, you know, more and more reports of decline. You know, the, the Audubon Common Birds in Decline report, which pointed out that some of the most common birds have declined by, you know, 70, 80 percent, the ones we think of often as the ones we expect in our backyards and the ones to see in our bays and coasts and grasslands. Um, you know, BirdLife International pointing out extinction rate in birds has doubled in the last hundred years and uh, something like 20 percent of the world's birds are listed on some kind of a conservation concern list. When I did my, my book, I, I had to figure out, you know, a, a, a round number to include in the book of species to profile and I, and I picked a hundred, you know, the typical round number to include and trying to figure out which hundred to include in the book, of course, is fraught with all kinds of pitfalls. Some of, the, some of them are really obvious, you know, the spotted owls and whooping cranes and so on. Um, but, but the, uh, don't, and by the way, don't try to read all those. I'll, I'll send around a copy of my book for you to um, look through the table of contents if you want. Um, but what I, one of the things I did in trying to figure this out is I looked at all the species of concern lists, you know, the partners in flight list, the fish and wildlife species of concern list, the endangered and threatened list, the shorebird and waterbird and grouse partnerships and so on, everybody's lists. Um, and, I, and this isn't even including the, the state lists. And it turns out that over half of our regularly occurring avifauna occur on one or more of those lists of species of concern. You know, it's just a kind of a phenomenal number. So um, there's a lot of things that are telling us the same story that we're hearing from broader assessments um, uh, work like this. If you look at um, just the habitats of birds and other, other creatures, uh, World, World Wildlife Fund study finding only nine of 76 ecoregions in the 48 states were not considered to be in critical, endangered, or vulnerable condition. Or NC um, study, 57% were imperiled or vulnerable. And you know, you've seen the Millennial Ecosystem Report degradation of uh, ecosystems and you know, these kind of things. It's clear. That, um, and that the, the state of our environment um, is not where we'd like it to be. And one of the ideas for, for this book that echoes some of the things um, uh, Lynn talked about was that I think all of us need to start trying to use birds as a, as a prism, as a lens to think about the, the broader view of the state of our environment and you know, ways we can help and to, to not be um, quite as focused just on um, birds by themselves. And I'll give you a little more... Um, thoughts about that. And so we have this paradox. Um, the number of birders increasing, you know, exponentially, and yet more and more declines. And it seems like a weird paradox. If there's so many people interested in birds, if, if it's such a, a strong conservation value, a strong value for people, why is it that that value, that interest and care, has not been translated into, into effects on, on policy and, and conservation? And there's, of course, many reasons for that. Um, but one of the reasons, I think, is in today's global economy, global um, systems of transport and manufacturing, people don't really know anymore where the products they use come from. They don't really know how their day-to-day -day decisions impact the things that they love. And 
Um, that's one of the things that I, I, again, I've tried to do um, in my book is try to make some of those connections for people. And as I'm talking around the country, I try to give some examples. I'm trying to use a, a relevant example here for today. Um, energy, usually I start off talking about um, global warming, but I actually left that out of this particular talk. Maybe I should have included it if I had talked to Lynn ahead of time. Um, but here we have... Uh, a graph showing um, where we get our electricity from. And you can see that um, if you look at that big wedge on the right there, that the amount we get from coal has actually increased since the 70s. And when I talk in, in Maine, where I'm from, or in New England, I like to point out that 25% of Maine's electric power is generated from coal. So it's sort of like a 25% chance when you flip on your light anywhere in New England um, that that energy came from coal. Where does most of that coal come from? You guys probably know the story of this, you know, Cerulean Warbler, the place of highest abundance, the place that conservation biology would tell us is the place we need to protect, um, is also the place where most of that coal comes from in mountaintop removal mining. Hundreds of thousands of acres that have been or are slated to be removed, hundreds of miles of streams filled um, so that people can turn on their lights here in D.C. and in, and in, and in New England. Um, and how many people know, have any idea that when they flip on their lights, they're actually causing um, the loss of habitat for this bird? One of Pete Blanchard's great maps showing the connections between, um, in this case, uh, Maine um, songbirds and where they winter. And, you know, another familiar story for all of you where these, where these birds winter, including northern South But how many people know that the largest open pit coal mine in the world is in northern South America in Colombia and, and that we're importing, you know, massive amounts of coal on barges up here to the mid-Atlantic states in New England to generate power? Um, you know, again, a connection that most people wouldn't know when you flip on the lights, how, the birds that you're actually impacting in that decision. A favorite one I have is the uh, short bill Dowager story. Um, a little bit hard to see here. Uh, if some of you have have um, looked at the ranges of, of short bill Dowager, or at least the the the, the ones that we um, the best guesses we have. One of the sort of two two major areas: one here and one here. So they have a rel relatively restricted range, and it turns out that if you think about where that, that map is of the, the range I just showed you in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and look at that where the, compared to this big orange blob you see, that's the uh, world's second largest oil deposit, 35 million acres, size of Florida, um, that is being seen by many in the energy industry and in um, certain parts of our government um, as the great savior for our energy needs for the future. Um, and, you, and you look at how, how, how that overlaps with, with a bird like the short-billed dowager, just as one example. An area that has to be strip mined, just like mountaintop removal mining, um, projected to be 400 plus thousand acres strip mined and another um, 20, 30 million acres that are going to be crisscrossed with a spider web of pipelines and roads. Um, and we're just going to getting ready to release a report on this, which I was going to point out that it's, there's uh, probably at least 100 million or more birds that are going to be lost in the next 30 to 50 years from this activity. 